Good morning, good morning, good night, depending on which part of the world you are watching this video from. I'm Black Bright, broadcasting out of the UK. And if it's the first time you're on my channel, then welcome. I talk about a variety of topics from politics to relationships to um, immigration, lots of different stuff. Anyway, um, today I decided to um, talk about something I read in a newspaper. It was written by someone called Courtier Newland, which is a who is a black man. He's a writer and a journalist. And he wrote this for, I think, either The Independent or The Guardian, that he felt oppressed when certain white women came on to him. And he shares his feelings, and I'm going to put the article below. Now, it was very difficult for him to talk about this, and I can imagine why. And it's probably very, very controversial. Um, he says he found it difficult to share it openly and wondered if his reluctance was driven by shame or whether he just couldn't believe what he experienced. I kind of worded that my own way, but like I said, you can read it in the link. He's talked about it to his close friends, but he's never mentioned it to women. Um, and the only, I can identify this to a point because... When I was in my 20s, I was dating a black man and this white woman totally ignored me. It was as if I wasn't there and went in on that black man. Now, I don't know if he was flattered by her. I don't know what, but she just spoke to him, laughed with him, put her arm around him and everything. And it was as though I wasn't there. And he would turn over and look and kind of shrug his shoulders and, you know, as if to say, what am I supposed to do? But in that moment, I was so angry and I composed this poem. Now, this poem is a long time, put it that way. I'm going to try and remember it, but if I don't, I'll just refer to it. It's called You Blonde and Blue-Eyed Beauties. You blonde and blue-eyed beauties are so ruthless in your attack on our vulnerable black men. Time and time again, you know and understand it is your pre-arranged plan that when they speak so innocently, absorbed in your seductory, you have one aim, which is to appear to tame the inherent racism of your kind. But you will find he's not blind. He'll overrule your ploy of manipulation of a situation where sexually you have control. It is your ploy to try and play my man away? Leave him alone. Slavery days are done, and the myth of white supremacy has already gone. Leave him alone to be free, to pursue his destiny, which is with me. Too long have you tried with your insensitive lies to build up the home of our love, to break up the home of our loving black men. This delicate love that never seems strong enough to survive is now trying hard to strive for sustenance and maintenance of life. You insidious bigoter, leave us alone forever. Leave us alone so that we can live and love and be ourselves together. Forever as one, we are black people alone. We do not need the favour of your wiles to beguile the purity of mind. This may seem unkind to you, but to me, all I see is my black man being taken away from me on some unconscious slavery ride. You, you unconsciously side with the oppressor. I know your capabilities as a seducer, because I too am a woman, a good one a black one, and that is why you must kiss him and say goodbye. Live and be free. Leave him to me, his woman, his wife, his right, his life. And I wrote that a long time ago. That's all I've got to say. I was in my 20s at the time. And those, those were the feelings it evoked when I felt that he almost seemed helpless at the time. I know that anyone can say, oh, look, you know, you can walk off and he can leave them. And, you know, he didn't have to speak to them. And it's disrespectful what he did to me and all that kind of gaff. I know all of that. 
And I know that if it was today, it would be a different kettle of fish because I probably, well, I know I wouldn't have tolerated that kind of disrespect. But back then, you know, I, as far as I was concerned, he was just an idiot. But anyway, that is beside the point. I'm not here to judge him. I'm not here to judge the woman. I'm just saying how she used her wiles to take him away from me in that time and space. I don't know if they ever met up afterwards. I have no idea. All I know is what I saw on that evening. So getting back to Courtier Newland, who he, he's on the other side. He's the black man who is being pursued by a woman. Now, the woman he refers to in his article is, I don't know if she's his boss, but it's a working relationship. Um, she's praised him on his work and then she said he's cute she said he's good looking she's inappropriately touched him and he's withdrawn and she's asked to see him for coffee and he's refused now what happens now is that he gets a call and she says she's broken down somewhere can he come and help her and he says no next thing you know he's lost his job and it's that kind of, um, not I, I don't know if it's um, superiority, but it's that kind of insidious control that a white woman will have over black men. You see, when black men, um, when white women approach black men initially, from what I, from what I observe, they're quite flattered. And it's almost like they've won a prize, you know, a white woman, oh, she fancies me, blah, blah, blah. And regardless of whether they're attracted to it or not, the main thing is, is that they feel as though they've won a prize initially. According to, um, what's his name? Courtier. It's a strange name. According to Courtier, he reckons that a white woman, when she sees a black man, she sees the hypersexualized version of a black man. And she just sees him as a object for sex. He's exotic. He looks sexy. You know, the myth of the big, the big black or whatever you want to call it. And all of that, it's a sexualized thing. When she sees a black man, ordinarily, they're attractive because, you know, of the myth of the black man. But what happens is, is that, you know, it's like sleeping with the enemy, according to Courtier, because what he's saying is, is that you'll be in one of these relationships. So he's obviously been in a relationship with white women, even though he didn't fancy that one. Um, but he said, it's like, if you don't do what they say, you're punished. If you're not up to having sex with them or whatever, um, they threaten you. And he was saying that, you know, a lot of men, if they reject them, you know, they're, they're afraid that they're going to either call the police or they're going to um, get them thrown in jail or they'll shout rape. I'm not saying um, this happens to all white women, of course not. And black women do it too. I know that. But we're talking about this particular man's article. And what the thing is, is that when you think of Botham Jean and that he was dating that, I don't know if he was dating her or whether, I think he was dating her, the white police officer, and she shot him because he didn't want to go out with her anymore. He didn't want to deal with her anymore. So she shot him and killed him. And when we think of little Emmett Till, a 14 year old boy who was lynched in 1955 for just looking at a white woman. And the white woman said she was offended by him looking at her. And he was lynched for that and killed 14. So a lot of black men feel as though they've come a long way. So they see it as a privilege being with white women. And once they've got into that, into that, um, into that, that, into their psyche, you know, they almost, they become controlled by them because, to be honest, unless that woman is ready to release you, you ain't going nowhere. So as much as a black woman will run up her mouth and you call her miserable and she's angry and she's this and that, I don't believe that you, well, we've got some mad people all over the world. You can't even say black or white, really, in this scenario. But because I'm referring to this particular article, 
it's, a, it's got totally different connotation when a black man is dealing with a white woman than when he's dealing with a black woman. So anyway, rather, rather than go off the track and get myself shot, um, I'm going to just read um, some of what he says. Um, let me see what he said. He said, comments like you look fit. No, he didn't say this. I, I took this from somewhere else. Comments like you look fit, exotic, sexy. I love black men. The leering looks, the licking of the lips, the playful touching. At first it can be flattering, but then it's bar it borders on harassment when they don't kind of take no for an answer. Especially if you're dealing with your woman and they still persist because they want you. They've decided that they want you and you better not reject them. You better not reject them. These are the, the ones who are like this. I'm not talking about all, but there's a certain type of white woman who set out for black men. They And they have this thing called plantation um, orgies where, you know, a lot of white women, they go to like the Caribbean, Africa, and they just go there to have sex with black men. Some of the black men who, who are hustling, they'll go with them and they'll make sure they get money out of it and probably disease as well. But the fact of the matter is that is their function to perform, just like on the plantation. A black man is there to perform. So he's not picking up the, the, um, the cotton, but he has to perform for the white woman, just like a performing monkey. If they say, I want sex, you've got to give them sex or else. Anyway, that's these particular ones that they're talking about here. OK, so he's saying work harassment is worse. They know they can do it and get away with it. They know they have the power and the control. They know the black man knows it too. For the black man, it's his livelihood. What does he do? Screw his boss and be unfaithful to his wife or reject her and lose his job? Is it something he can share with his friends? Sometimes the friends ridicule and minimise and negate what he's feeling because I can imagine in certain cases it, it can have psychological implications. Um, and I was also thinking about white men who are angry that white women are sleeping with black men. They get the pleasure in punishing and torturing black men for trespassing on what they call white territory. We've seen it, we've heard it and you know and it still exists. I was watching uh, one of those American programs where they were talking about um, these white women. They called, didn't even call them white if they if they looked at a black man. They called them traitors. They said, you're not white. <coughs> Sorry. Anyway, um, they are the hypersexualized stereotype. If a black man refuses to reciprocate, doesn't meet their expectations or wants to call it a day and the white woman is not ready to call it a day, they are punished. And there are no consequences for the single and sometimes partnered white female. So even though, I mean, if a black man does so happen, just supposing he does say he doesn't want this woman and he rejects her and she decides to say, OK, I'm going to get you for this. You're going to pay for rejecting me. And she she calls rape or whatever. He's the one that's going to be punished. He's the one that's going to be beaten up. He's the one that's going to be killed. There's got not going to be any consequences for her because she's placed on the pedestal. So like I said, not all partners in interracial relationships experience the same dynamics, but they exist in some. Otherwise, this sensitive article would not have been printed. And like I said, it's going to be in the link. Um... Oh, I've got something here. How does having to perform sex for white women make them feel and affect them psychologically when they don't really want to, but are afraid to say no? Black men are basically sex workers for the white female. From the woman who got Emmett Till lynched to the woman who called the police on the man wearing socks at the swimming pool to the woman who called the police on a group of black men having a barbecue from the police officer who killed Botham Jean to the woman who reported the eight year old girl for selling water. The underlying threat is do as you're told or else is always the is always there deep inside the male psyche, according to the writer. Black men who complain are ridiculed, bloody lucky she's interested in you, their feelings are minimised or completely negated. 
This particular paragraph touched me though. The fear of being in close proximity with people who may become colleagues, family, lovers, assailants, accusers, abusers or harassers. The danger of loving someone who might possibly racially abuse you in the furious heat of a domestic argument. The confusing seesaw desire of wanting to be an alley for someone's struggle while not having your struggle recognised in return. I thought that was quite very, very deep. And then um, to exacerbate the scenario, we have something called blackfishing, where white women are changing their skin colour, their features, their hair tusk texture to appear black, appropriating black features to make themselves more sexually attractive to the black man. So, yeah. So, um, I don't know if this makes sense, but I think you get my point. There'll probably be, um, I'll probably get a big bollock in for this, but, you know, read his article. And all I'm doing is commenting on my experience from it. And he is he's talking from his experience. And that's all for now. Bye-bye.